In this lecture, we're going to describe immune deficiency diseases. We're going to begin by talking about primary immune deficiency diseases, and then we'll move into secondary. Primary immune deficiency diseases are also known as congenital. So these are ones that are hereditary, ones that uh, we inherit from the genome. And if there are any defects or gene mutations, we actually will uh, pass these um, from one individual on to offspring. Secondary are acquired. So these are ones that can be um, caught, if you will. We can be infected with these. Uh, one of the classic ones that we'll look at later in the lecture is HIV. Uh, but acquired secondary diseases, uh, immunodeficiency diseases, are ones that can be transferred theoretically from mother to developing fetus. Um, you can catch it as a child, as an adolescent, or even as an adult. In this overview, this mechanistic tree, we're looking at the primary immune deficiencies. These tend to be single gene defects, and we're going to look at really three out of the five that are listed here. We'll look at B cell deficiencies, T cell deficiencies. We'll look at when both happen in a situation known as severe combined immunodeficiency disease, otherwise known as SCID, or an ADA deficiency. And then number four, number five, complement and phago sites um, can have single gene defects, and they can have ramifications with respect to um, primary deficiency problems. We're just not going to go into the details of those. We're only going to have time to cover the first three on the list. If you look at the top of this slide, uh, you can appreciate that uh, we're going to start in the bone marrow, this pink box, and I'm going to look at this in higher magnification later. This is where we are in the bone marrow. And for orientation standpoint, we're going to start with a pluripotent stem cell, and we can either go to the left or we can go to the right. If we go to the right, or excuse me, if we go to the left, uh, we give rise to the B cell lineage. And down here at the bottom, you can see the usual suspects when we have mature B cells. We have immunoglobulins like IgA, IgG, IgE, IgD, IgM. Um, if we go back up and we go to the right, we can see that we give rise to our T cell population. And these are either CD8 positive T cells or CD4 positive T cells. And anywhere along the way where you see these red squiggly lines, we actually are subjected to a possible single gene defect that could lead to a deficiency. So again, this is a defect in the genome and anywhere along this uh, lineage tree that we're gonna look at some specific examples, we could have different types of ramifications for primary immune deficiencies. First off is a B cell example. So we're gonna focus our attention, we're zoomed in now, to the bone marrow. We're at the top of that um, sort of mechanistic tree on the previous slide. And we're gonna move from pluripotent stem cells that are up here at the top of the slide. We're gonna move down. We get normal pro B cells and then we get pre B cells made. And then if we have this X-linked gamma globulemia, also known as Bruton disease, we actually uh, don't produce B cells. If we don't produce these B cells, um, then we're never gonna produce the types of antibodies that these B cells would normally make. Um, in this disorder, um, it was discovered in 1952. Um, it is a sex-linked or a rare X-linked genetic disorder. And uh, the body's ability to fight infection is compromised. It is uh, much more common in males because of its X-linked characteristic. And these patients uh, that don't develop uh, mature B cells um, have either low levels of B cells or completely absent. Um, the pre B cells don't ever differentiate into these mature B cells. The challenge exists where they, they don't make the light chain. They actually do make the heavy chain, but not the light chain. And um, they have low and absent B cell, low or absent B cell populations, low or absent plasma cell populations. They have an underdeveloped um, lymph nodes and or pyres patches that are found in the intestine. Um, but they do have a quote unquote normal T cell response because remember that T cell response is found on the other side of this mechanistic tree. 
Moving on further to more B cell examples, uh, we're a little further down this mechanistic tree and I'm gonna highlight uh, one more B cell example. This one is a little lower down and so this is called an IgA deficiency where these patients um, are subjected to recurrent infections. They have trouble making IgA and um, these recurrent infections uh, that show up uh, are, are typically found where IgA is normally going to be um, present. So either in blood, which is the IgA1 subtype, or in body secretions, which is the IgA2 subtype. So IgA1 is blood and IgA2 is body secretions. The IgA deficiency happens to be the most common primary deficiency that we, that we see. If we look over at the T cell side, we go to the right side of this mechanistic tree, uh, we're not going to affect B cell development here. These point mutations along this tree are going to affect the development of mature T cells, whether they're uh, CD8 positive T cells at the bottom here, or whether they're CD4 positive helper T cells. And the disease I want to highlight is what we call DeGeorge syndrome. In these patients that suffer from DeGeorge syndrome, uh, they have a partial or a complete lack of, thy of the thymus. They have um, a lack or very low levels of mature T cells. They have challenges in fighting viral infections, fungal, as well as protozoan infections. Um, in some patients, we've uh, discovered in pediatric medicine that a thymus transplant may be helpful, but it's not always helpful. Um, DeGeorge syndrome was first described in 1968 by a pediatric endocrinologist known as Angelo DeGeorge. Um, he figured it out, so he gets it named after him. Uh, the, the, the lesion is a small piece of chromosome 22, and it occurs somewhere in, near the middle of the chromosome uh, on the long arm of one of the pairs of chromosome 22. And it has a prevalence in the patient population of about one in 4,000 patients. If we look further higher on this mechanistic tree, we work back up towards the top, where we're back in the bone marrow, uh, we have a very severe situation, uh, which is a combination of a B and a T cell deficiency. We refer to this as adenosine deaminase uh, deficiency, otherwise known as severe combined immunodeficiency disease, abbreviated SCID. And in, in these patients, um, they have a disease where they're very susceptible to um, all sorts of types of infectious um, agents because not only do they lack B cells, but they also lack functional T cells. So we're further up on this mechanistic tree and these pluripotent stem cells that are shown here at the top, they can differentiate into a lymphoid precursor, but they never move on to pro B cells or pro T cells. And the disease was well characterized in the media a couple of decades ago um, as bubble boy disease. And so these patients have to live in a sterile environment as a result of a completely compromised immune system. We're switching gears now to secondary uh, immune diseases or secondary immune deficiencies. And in this portion, we're gonna describe some things that um, cause uh, a disease state as a result of something else. So what are these? These are common causes uh, that can result in a secondary uh, immune deficiency. Things like malnutrition, things like stress, cancer, iatrogenic causes, uh, as well as infection. So some examples, malnutrition, okay, uh, under caloric intake or a compromised caloric intake may mean that the immune system isn't gonna have the energy to do the things that it normally should do. Um, in addition to that, we could have a depletion of zinc intake. And if we deplete zinc intake, then that will deplete B and T cell production. Zinc is an important precursor or uh, facilitator in the maturation of B and T lymphocytes. 
Uh, it's one of the reasons that um, when you're sick, a lot of times these over-the-counter uh, meds or solutions have zinc supplementation in them. There's a little bit of science associated with that. Stress, we know that in stressful situations, uh, we increase the amount of glucocorticoid release and glucocorticoids naturally suppress the immune system. Uh, so stress levels can cause the immune system to be compromised and we're more at risk of developing a secondary immune deficiency disorder. Cancer, um, cancer, things like Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphomas um, can deplete specifically lymphocyte populations and that can lead us more vulnerable to a immunodeficiency disorder. Um, iatrogenic uh, causes, these are, uh, this is a word, iatrogenic is a word that means an adverse side effect from something. So surgery and anesthesia are uh, two of the biggest culprits for iatrogenic causes. Um, we may intentionally suppress um, the immune system, like for example, in the treatment of cancer. Uh, it's one of the side effects when we use chemotherapy agents or otherwise known as drugs that are going to kill and target fast replicating cells. Well, the bone marrow becomes suppressed in those cases, uh, unfortunately, as a side effect. And if we suppress the bone marrow, we have a smaller population to develop new functional B and T lymphocytes. And so now we may have a situation of secondary immune deficiency. And then lastly, infection. Infection can cause an overall challenge on the system and it may suppress our ability to fight off um, an invader. Let's look now at um, really one of the more um, widely described secondary immune deficiency um, disease. So this is secondary in the sense that it's not hereditary. Um, it is acquired, you can catch it. Um, and we appropriately name it Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, AIDS. Um, the uh, AIDS syndrome really comes from the etiology. The beginning of this is what we call human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. Um, we believe that HIV probably arose from a primate source, from a simian immunodeficiency virus. And we believe the data suggests that it began diversifying in about the 1930s. It was found to first hop into the species of humans in 1959 in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, transmission, the epidemiology, how do we catch it? Uh, transmission is usually via blood, IV drug use, or sexual intercourse. Uh, sexual intercourse could be either heterosexual or homosexual. Today, the most common form of transmission is actually heterosexual intercourse from man to woman or woman to man. Um, the last category is uh, maternal to fetal transfer. So that's another fourth category of how it can transmit from one individual to another. So on the screen, what you're looking at right now is in the lower left, you're looking at a CD4 positive T cell. This is a helper T cell in blue. And this structure right here is the virus, the HIV virus, as it's physically attached and docked. And it is in the process of infecting this helper T cell with the virus. It's a retrovirus, um, so that means it's made out of RNA. You can see on the right side of the slide, um, there's two copies of the retrovirus. And it is housed in a lipid envelope. And the lipid envelope is actually from the host. Continuing on with our description of, of the HIV virus, uh, we really have two different variations, two different main variations. Um, the virus itself has a, a high mutation rate, whether it's HIV-1 subtype or HIV-2 subtype. And HIV-1 tends to be the more common of the two that's isolated from patients in the US, Europe, and Central Africa. HIV-2 is more common in West Africa. Now, if you look at the virus core inside, as it transfects into the host, it takes on the lipid envelope from the host, okay? The virus core has um, a caspid protein known as P24, and you can see this P24 protein right here is this yellow colored um, structure. And that's the protein that we actually detect in blood tests for HIV.
has two copies of RNA uh, inside of this um, uh, uh, lipid uh, virus core. And um, it contains three viral enzymes, including reverse transcriptase. Um, reverse transcriptase, if you recall back to some of your previous coursework, uh, you'll remember that this is a very effective mechanism to take RNA information, turn it into a cDNA copy, and from which um, propagate uh, the new DNA that you want from the virus into the host. What is the pathogenesis of HIV? How does it work? Well, it specifically targets the immune system. Um, and even more specifically than that, it actually targets CD4 positive T cells. So CD4 positive T cells uh, most commonly are known as helper T cells. But just a side note, macrophages as well as dendritic cells also carry and express the CD4 cluster of differentiation and they can also be infected. But what needs to take place, as you can see from this slide, is that the virus needs to dock with the CD4 molecule. And then a conformational change happens. And then there's membrane penetration. And then the um, viral information is allowed to enter into the host cell. Okay? So let me walk you through this process. Um, the CD4 uh, for docking protein right here interacts with a protein found on the virus complex known as GP120. GP120 is this spherical looking protein and GP120 binds directly to C, uh, CD4. Now what's important to note is in order for um, GP120 to bind and dock to CD4 is you need this receptor known as CCR5. CCR5 is a receptor that has been discovered to be critically important for allowing this docking to take place. Once the docking take place, takes place, um, a conformational change ensues. You can see how this structure right here, this virus structure, kind of tilts. Um, the uh, GP120 binds to the chemo chemokine receptor, which is this receptor down here, which is another plasma membrane bound uh, protein to the CD4 positive T cell. This is the CD4 positive T cell cytoplasm down here. This is the helper T cell. And once that takes place, now the GP41 um, actually allows for penetration into the membrane and then you have membrane fusion. And the virus will fuse with the cell. The virus core enters. Reverse transcriptase is going to manufacture uh, DNA and integrase chaperones the CDA, cDNA into the nucleus. At this point in time, we may uh, be in a latent period of time or a period of time that we call clinical latency, where the um, information is infected into the host cell, but it may not be replicated for months or even years. Now, lastly, on this slide, you'll see CNS is listed. Uh, the central nervous system can be targeted um, in certain cases where the CD4 population within the nervous system becomes infected, and this can lead to meningitis. Uh, it can lead to other diseases such as AIDS dementia complex, uh, where uh, CD4 populations in nervous tissue are compromised via this same mechanism. Now, something that's of interest here is the CCR5 receptor is critically important for this docking to take place. And what we've discovered in recent research in the literature is that there are certain individuals that are actually defective for CCR5. So being defective for CCR5 is actually beneficial because these patients who are a homozygous mutation, they lack CCR5 and they are essentially immune to infection by the HIV virus. Now at this point in the lecture, um, if it wasn't AV format, there'd be hands going up in the, in the lecture hall. I don't have the ability to answer those questions, obviously, but please send me your email questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, this is probably a space of new interesting research in the future about what is the role of that CCR5 receptor. And one of the logical questions you might be asking yourself is, well, can we develop a blocking antibody for CCR5? Really good question.
um, can we neutralize um, the ability for the HIV virus to even dock? Okay, so once it's infected, now how does infection progress? Okay, that's what this slide is, is trying to describe. So if you look over to the upper right, you can see that the primary infection, which is an acute infection, right? This is gonna target CD4 populations. These could be um, helper T cells right here on the left or dendritic or phagocytic macrophages. And they become infected uh, as the primary infection and they infiltrate or circulate into the lymphatics, okay? So they end up in lymphoid tissue like the lymph node, which is shown here. Then you have a situation known as viremia. So what is viremia? Viremia is a medical condition where viruses enter the bloodstream and they have access to the rest of the body. So this is a way that it can go into a systemic situation. Okay, this can go throughout the entire body, what we call a chronic infection. We can spread the infection throughout the body in a systemic fashion due to this viremia because now the infected um, cells are being transported throughout the body. So back to this drawing, you have um, the B cell side, right? Anti-HIV antibodies are manufactured. And then we have cytotoxic T cells. These T cells are making HIV specific um, uh, effector cytotoxic T cells to go out and try to manage uh, the infection that's actually taken place. This is part of the body's natural immune response. In the next slide, we'll see how this has some benefit for a period of time. And we enter this phase known as clinical latency. Okay, this is where the virus kind of stays dormant. And as a dormant virus, right, we have some latent infection and we have a low level of infection that later on, after it comes out of its latency period, um, as it's circulating around, uh, it may end up in other lymphoid tissues. It may end up in splenic tissue in the spleen and we have ongoing replication and we have some level of cell death because some of those cells get attacked and killed uh, due to the ability of the cytotoxic T cells or the ability of the antibodies. But um, eventually you enter the end of clinical latency and we have excessive viral replication and we lose too many of our CD4 positive cells, otherwise known as our helper, helper T cells. After we lose that population, unfortunately, we enter this realm known as AIDS, okay? And we call this, another word for it is crisis. So AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, is the end stage of HIV. And what's happened is the HIV virus has replicated to a point um, where it is winning the battle and the CD4 positive T cells that have been infected are being removed. They're being destroyed by the body's immune system. And so populations of CD4 positive T cells drop and the numbers of virus copies goes up. That's exactly what we're gonna describe on this last slide. There's a lot of information on this slide, so we're gonna dissect it out. Um, the question is, what's the clinical progression of HIV? Human uh, immunodeficiency virus. Well, we have at the top of the slide, we've got three phases. We have our acute phase, we have our chronic phase, and we have our crisis or our AIDS phase. And we talked about these three phases in the previous slide. On the y-axis, we, we have the number of T cells, CD4 positive T cells on this axis. And they're designated by these blue um, uh, markers. So you can see it's gonna track something like this. On this axis, we have uh, viremia, or the number of HIV copies uh, in the blood. And it's denoted by the yellow um, markers. And it's gonna look something like this line right here over time. And then on the um, x-axis, we have time. And, and these little hash marks means that it's not to scale because we move into weeks and then we move into this latency period where we have years. And there may be in certain patients where uh, we fortunately have a long clinical latency, which is like what you see with some of the more popularized um, infected individuals in the media, like Magic Johnson, Erwin Magic Johnson from uh, the Lakers, former NBA basketball player, has been in clinical latency for a long period of time. 
Okay, so we've got our different phases. Let's describe what happens. Uh, well, let's start over here at the origin, right? Zero, zero. Well, um, the normal uh, thousand uh, cells per cubed millimeter uh, volume wise uh, starts out here. The primary infection, you lose some of these cells because the immune system is killing those that are infected. Well, then after about six weeks time, um, they start coming uh, back up and they enter this clinical latency period and they may stay at this level for a long period of time. Well, slowly over time, the number of infected cells increases and they continue to be destroyed by the immune system until about nine to years or so on this graph. And again, this will vary for every case. Um, they reach a critical situation. If we look simultaneously what's happening at the number of uh, copies of the virus, we can see in the first six weeks, we peak out with the maximum number. And then the body does a good job of trying to reduce that number. And that number of viral copies is actually maintained throughout the latency period. But at some point in time, right about that nine year mark, the same about time that the CD4 population plummets, um, the copies start increasing because we lose our ability to fight it off. And in this phase of AIDS, otherwise known as the crisis mode, we are attacked by opportunistic diseases. Uh, these patients are attacked by things like um, pneumonia, um, sort of um, manageable uh, diseases that we normally could fight off, uh, but our immune system is so compromised and usually uh, it is something like pneumonia or maybe a certain type of cancer that would have been managed um, had the body had its own immune system functional. Um, those types of opportunistic diseases are what usually take these patients' lives rather than the AIDS itself. In this lecture, we uh, talked about primary and secondary immune deficiencies. We talked about um, a very specific example of secondary immune deficiencies being HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. And then we characterize the clinical progression of HIV to AIDS.